Well, there's just there were so many points in the interviews I listened to on your podcast where people would describe a sentiment or a feeling that I immediately recognized. There was, um, a, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember their names right now. You had a, someone who who wrote about traveling through Europe and they tried to replicate or try to follow the same path as a previous traveler mm. from like a century previous, something like that. So things have changed tremendously in Europe since the 1920s or whatever it was, right? Or whatever period that was. Um, and, uh, you know, t- talking about this, this person said something that was like, walking through Europe, walking through these landscapes, these communities, interacting with people and with the landscape in that way. That was the human, that's the pace that human beings are kind of meant to uh, travel. Hmm. That's what we've evolved to do. That's how we are as organisms. That's what we do. Our anatomy allows us to do this, generally speaking, for able-bodied people. But generally, yes, we can do this. Getting on a car, even in a car, not even discussing air travel, which is a whole other fucking thing, right? But mm. even in a car, I noticed this even in the city I live in right now. Walking through this city is a completely different experience than when I have to drive. It's very, very different. It's like uh, my sense of risk is different. My sense of understanding where I'm at, like it's all very different. Um but yeah, this person describing how when they had to leave this months long trip walking through these communities and all these things, the other reflections they had, they got on a plane and described like a real sense of almost, it was like a bit of guilt and remorse, a feeling like this isn't right. Like something Mm. is off, right? I mean, I just personally feel like hopping on a flight and traveling to a completely different hemisphere that's having a completely different set of seasons, right? Like when I went from Northern to Southern hemisphere in the middle of winter, it actually took me probably two or so weeks for me to feel like I've adjusted. It wasn't just like jet lag in the sense of like, I need to catch up on my sleep. It was like, I was having dreams where I was in the middle of winter and I would wake up Uh, and it would be sweltering hot and humid and there were mosquitoes uh, biting me. And it was not, it was, it was, it was, it was a trip. It was really a trip. I did not feel like my spirit was, as they say, your spirit did not travel with me, had not, had not arrived yet. hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really think about like what it means, not just through the sense of tourism, but just the sense of like of air travel and how pervasive that is and how we move around the world and how we don't even feel at home in the places where we pay rent or pay our mortgages. Hmm. And we especially don't feel necessarily at home when we're flying and visiting somewhere and traveling as a tourist or or even on a business trip or whatever it may be, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it has huge ramifications. And we can't even tell when we talk about the larger, you know, ecological and climatological effects of this. It doesn't even seem to register that we're all kind of participating in our own demise, you know, in that mm. in that the desire to escape is very real and very human, I guess. But um, there's no escaping that, mm. you know, mm. like. I I almost feel I admit there's a bit of Schadenfreude or a little bit of this like resentment that emerges in 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 it's a manifest online when you hear about people going to Burning Man and it floods, or people go to the, some weird stupid music festival on an island and they're kind of left there with no food and no way to leave right no shelter. Um, when travelers go to some location and it's on fire, you know I mean it's actually horrific for the people that live in that place obviously, but for the travelers. It's there's a bit of like you paid so much money to come here and it just never matched. It obviously didn't match your expectations. And you might have, you know, I admit that there's um, not the best feelings that come up, <laughs> but a bit of like this is where I think for me, the grumpiness I mentioned of tourism, which is at this point in 2024, I feel such a like what I almost have a nostalgia for at the beginning of the pandemic were those restrictions. Mm. was that sense of like people were forced to stay still for a few months or a few weeks i don't care if it made them uncomfortable it was a re- it felt like a a moment where everyone was forced to breathe for a moment mm-hmm. and i hate the fact that it takes a global pandemic for that to happen you know and and worse that you know it wasn't enough. 
No, it wasn't. That's and, the thing, right? We're that back to where we were. You know, uh, cruel, yeah. uh, and and you know, but in the context of what we're talking about, um, we could say at the very least that you know it wasn't enough time that mm-hmm. uh, people were made to to stop and stay still and you know reflect. I mean, not that the the not that not that reflecting was um, was uh, <laughs> you know part of the government. Uh, plans or anything like that but uh. (laughs) no yeah i mean in some way the getting back to normal was like almost important for the sort of consumer culture because if we were forced to sort of be less of a consumer culture then there would be potentially devastating uh, consequences i mean i don't think it's a coincidence in the u.s especially there were massive uprisings and protests Right. I think that mm. there was a synchronicity there in a way that I think is important to, to maybe recognize, even though the issues may seem pretty dis- different as um, far as pandemic and like social justice, but um, or, or, you know, racial, uh, you know, like brutality, police brutality and things like this. But um, yeah, I actually want to talk about this one final thing, because there's, again, this concept that came up over and over again. I thought it was fascinating how it was discussed in your podcast, and I wanted to bring it up in this one, which is about revenge tourism, because, again, this sort of returning to normalcy, which is about a returning to the travel, uh, the type of traveling that people you know regularly would engage in prior to tw- uh, 2020. Um, yeah, there was certainly a real sense. I've talked about this with my partner, which is like noticing friends traveling more so than they even did before the pandemic like they're hopping on planes more they're going to places more and you know the term that's used in your podcast is revenge tourism and the question that came up in one of your discussions was fascinating it's like who's who's the revenge toward who's Mm, revenge against what and so i want to ask you what this concept means to you and yeah to sort of again bring this up for you which is Okay, if we're if it's revenge, then what's it revenge toward yeah. or against? I mean, I think it's uh, it's definitely absurd, and uh, and it, you know, I don't I don't remember exactly how or where that term arose. Uh, it was in you know I think late twenty twenty, um, and coming out of this notion that people had been you know locked up. I mean, really, if you want to use that terminology, right? Uh, Locked up, (laughs) cooped up for however long, you know, months, some people over a year and longer. Um, Mm -hmm. And in all of that, so many people, you know, probably people who had traveled and been been tourists before, that was the only thing they could think of. I'm just like, when can I get on the first plane? You know, as you Mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. And so someone coined this term revenge tourism as you know, a kind of um, phenomenon where in which people would just, you know, travel as much as they wanted to or could um, as a result of having to stay still. Um, And so what happened, what was pretty amusing to me anyways, was that uh, the people in the sustainable tourism world or industry <clears throat> immediately got on got on the internet and they got on the bullhorn like no this is we cannot call it this we cannot call it this right because it just it sounds it sounds vile right and it sounds it like is, yeah. who uh-huh. like w- what does that even mean and yeah that's the question that comes up like revenge okay f- for having been cooped up for that long but against who because yeah. if you're leaving the country like that doesn't necessarily serve your own government who no. maybe was enforcing these lockdowns mm. doesn't serve, you know, your neighbors um, because, you know, you're going to be absent. Then you can't be a neighbor. Um, but then it seems then, okay, so then what do you, you know, the focus is where you're going. And then, so are you taking this revenge out on the very places and people you expect to be hosting you? And in that context, it kind of opens up this, this, I think, or at least reveals this really um, kind of honest take uh, within, not within the industry, but of the industry, uh, of our our ways of, you know, not being at home or our unwillingness to be at home, you know, and, and, uh, and all of these things, you know, any excuse, 
um, oh, because, you know, I had this time to, to reflect on what I haven't done in my life. And then it becomes this kind of bucket list scenario. So I'm just going to do this and I'm going to do this and fuck everything mm -hmm. else. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the possibility of you walking down the street, uh, walking to a neighbor's house or exploring the local, uh, park or forest or Creek bed or whatever it might be, uh, is, is immediately lost, right? Your, your ability, not just not to be at home because that when we say that it sounds like a skill, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but your ability to know the place you live in, to know home, to recognize it as such, right? And that those, how those two things weave together. And so, you know, while it's, um, doesn't speak necessarily directly to, to her work, I think the, you know, uh, the term, uh, Donna Harway's term, uh, stay with the trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Is, is really the, um, the, the, the hard, and maybe that's an understatement, uh, arduous and enduring work of our time is, you know, not to stop traveling altogether, right? Not to like live some lockdown life, but mm -hmm. to find out within the framework of our anatomy, right? Within the framework of, as you were saying, the human body, the limits that we've that have been placed on us you know either through evolution or creation or however you want to look at it um as traveling bodies and to find a way to travel within one's own place and i'm and i don't just mean like among the more than human world uh, i don't just mean uh in terms of the plants and animals you know recognizing them but also the people that you live near or alongside traveling within uh, those circles in order to deepen, uh, I shouldn't say, well, sure, to deepen, but also to regenerate the forms and skills of hospitality, which is to say how we show up as hosts or guests in, uh, the, in front of the stranger, in front of the other, the cultural other as well, and to honor that. Right. So that maybe when we do go somewhere else, we have some idea of what being a good guest actually means, because we've done that our whole lives uh, or at least started to do it in the places that we live in. Right? Mm. And then maybe we're not bringing homelessness to that place that we that we go. Right. That we might even be invited by virtue of our understanding um, of how to craft a skill and a culture of deep local um, embodied and shared hospitality with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I really like that a lot. I mean, I was thinking about the, the, the things that make a home a home. And, and if you really, if I think about when I was a child, what made me feel at home, whether in my own home or at the homes of my friends and their families, is exactly, it's, it's incredible hospitality. Everything felt like you could touch it with your hands almost. Like there was a sense of, I don't know how, I don't know how to describe it, there's mm. an intimacy to it. Like the the as a kid, you know, you kind of run around and explore your spaces. And I feel like, what is inevitably missing actually and and why i think so many people feel that challenge that you're describing because it is actually very arduous i think that's a good word because it's like the places we live are not always very hospitable they're not mm. um they're quite ugly actually mm. when i think about where i'm actually from where i was born and raised i think of the cities and the areas it's like it's basically an agricultural sacrifice zone mixed with cities that are dominated by cars and it's quite an ugly place, you know, and I don't feel like I could ever feel at home there, you know? So I think there is this, um, uh, you know, the ability to make community is a skill that 
is uh, I admit hard to know how to how to do and how to make home is a really difficult thing to do. And I actually want to maybe reference something which when we talked about all this is like um, some of the hard turns to the right that I've seen politically uh, towards like almost a fascism, frankly, mm. is that it is, I think, a longing for home, actually. It's mm. perverse. It's xenophobic. It's genocidal. It's all these horrible things. But there's a sense of like belonging that is really desired by by folks, right? They want to feel like they're part of something. And um, I don't know. I think uh, often like kind of modern neoliberal capitalism and how it manifests in the world is like a way of kind of diffusing some of these feelings toward ways to make profit and, and tourism is part of that. Mm. And things start to break down. It actually manifests in really horrific violence and like militarization of borders and this sort of like hard right, far right politics too. So the alternative to all of that is to focus on this question of what is hospitality? What does it mean to be a good host? What does it mean to be a good guest? And um, I, yeah, I don't know what else to say that. No, I guess I, just, I, I wanted to bring I that think, in. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think I lost you there for a second, but I, I don't think oh. I lost, I didn't lose the thread. So. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this has also been fascinating for me. Of course, this is something that I think that was, you know, very clear uh, for a lot of people, um, probably a lot of your listeners during during the the first couple of years of the pandemic, where you saw you know something that was highlighted in large part by the keyword uh, conspirituality, um, mm-hmm. that kind of move of you know progressive uh, liberals, um, maybe leftists, you know towards kind of like a, you know a Trumpian or a, or a far right. Um, sentiment i don't know ideology but sentiment certainly yeah Mm -hmm. um and what's happened you know what i've noticed here and as a result of the podcast and kind of you know digging into other places not just oaxaca but you know it's things that i've seen online and people have told me this uh in places like medellin uh, and colombia bali these places that are generally um already touristed but also now um changing very rapidly, gentrifying very quickly uh, because of remote workers, digital nomadism, uh, you know, very quick uh, upticks in, in, in tourism. And, uh, and what I've noticed is that people on the left or the so-called left, I, I don't know if I, how to exactly yeah. call it anymore, but um, mm-hmm. have begun to exude... Um, I'll say behaviors, um, perspectives, um, terminologies that are, for me, anyways, uh, reminiscent of 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 the far right. Um, what what you see, you know, in Mexico as an example, uh, just to make it a little more clear, perhaps, is um, because Mexico, of course, shares a border with the United States, and so when the lockdowns came in the United States, a lot of those people who did leave or who did come to Mexico were were Americans, Canadians as well, but uh, certainly uh, in large part Americans. Um, And then that increased uh, in the, in the following years as, you know, Oaxaca became this destination for people to, uh, to move to, you know, temporarily or or indefinitely, permanently Um, in the same way that, you know, uh, North Americans have done this in pl- places like Florida or Cancun or San Miguel de Allende. And what you see in that is that because there is this tourism infrastructure that and and a kind of cultural passivity among like local people here, I think that keeps the foreigner at at a at arm's reach, right? That they are identified either racially, or or via the nation state, right? So so they're just a gringo or a gringa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or whitey or whatever. And what that's done uh, as a result has reinforced uh, uh, the kind of a racialization of of people who are not white in in within Mexico, for example, among mm-hmm. the so-called left, 
right? Mm. And so some people will say, well, it's not racism. You know, that can be, that's a, a, an argument that can be debated, of course, but what it, what it at the very least is doing is reproducing um, the basis for racism in this part of the world, which were the racial identities that were imposed on uh, local people by the Spanish some three, 400 years ago. But more so is, is you see this, the nation state, right? So they're American and that means who are we? We're Mexican, right? Wow. And so this, this impulse to, to self-identify with the nation state among people who have, you know, ideologically for as long as uh, the quote unquote left has been around, uh, for the by and large, not not always, but by and large, been a critic of the nation state as an entity, as as you know, yes. as an, as uh, something to be identified with, um, and and so yeah, you see as well this kind of movement, and and maybe it's not people turning towards you know the right, but maybe this kind of um, <clears throat> um, xenophobic. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even even not just resentment, but even hatred towards the foreigner rising on the left. You know, alongside um, the kind of politics that uh, you know maybe traditional leftists would would uh, identify with. So, um, so you know, in in a lot of instances, in in part because of the complex dynamics that came out of the uh, the beginning of the pandemic and the dropping of travel restrictions and things like that, uh, tourism has been um, a cause of this political um, shift in, in, in mm. ideology or um, in identity politics uh, mm-hmm. against the foreigner. And so mm. essentially, yeah, and, and I don't think it's, um, I don't think all of it's, I don't think it all is kind of, What's the word? Um, like it doesn't necessarily arise or arrive uh, naturally. I know that's not the right word. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am saying is that there are a lot of these, the consequences of these politics in places like the United States and Canada, in places that don't have tourism, those same politics are making their way into uh, places and contexts and dynamics that do. Uh, and so there's also this kind of question of how social media and uh, and the internet has created uh, the the fluidity where in which uh, even these uh, seemingly uh, kind of insular um, ideologies, which is to say, like okay, maybe I just imagine you know a kind of rural right wing white American male. Yeah. Uh, and then suddenly the same dynamics are, are coming into play amongst um, young, uh, you know, uh, prietos, dark-skinned uh, Mexican women, feminists, right? And like, so like, so like, what's going on here? And maybe like yeah. this, this whole like left-right dynamic or spectrum is, is, is just too, too limiting anymore. And we need to start thinking outside of those, those, those boxes, perhaps. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I don't know if I have any like good insights or or any contributions to that, but I know for sure there is this fluidity as you describe it. I think that's pretty good. Um it's interesting that I think globalization is manifested in all these different ways. I think mm. with digital technology with social media, it's also manifested in the way that certain ideologies or or fragments of little bits of ideology and and manifestation of identity politics which is quite a broad thing mm. um gets laundered into because i don't even think it's a conscious thing i don't right. i don't even think it's something that any self-respected leftist would admit that they're xenophobic they would not because that right. is obviously antithetical to what the left is in fact Traditionally, the left is internationalist, and you know, and it is respectful of you know lo- localities, and or at least it should be. But um, it is also recognizing that as as a global movement, it's about building solidarity. But mm. yeah, there is certainly a rigidity that can emerge in a community where these same sentiments and dynamics you're describing can manifest in rural 
U.S., which is like, you know, somewhat depressed, poor, white communities, for example, not always, but in those kind of contexts, and then it can manifest in an entirely different racial category, racialized category of people. We speak very different language from a very different location, right? Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know what that is. I mean, I remember it blew my mind a little bit when I found out that there was like, not, I want to say it's like popular in, in the sense of having real effect on the politics of a region, but there is a neo-Nazi movement in Mexico mm. and they are all white. Mm. And it was like really weird. I was like, what is happening here? Right? Like there's, there's a weird thing happening and I don't know what it is. It's not, they're not leftists, right? These aren't leftists I'm talking about, but I, I do think that there's, there's, there's a strangeness to this time and speaking of the ways that human beings travel certain ideas and, and aesthetics and things that actually don't have a whole lot of like actual substance, but they get like transported and they'd end up kind of getting laundered into other places and other people's mm. start like practicing it in some level. It's very strange. And I, I don't know if I have any other contribution to that thought. It's just, I, I think it is weird when you, again, speaking to how like I saw some uh, com a mix of feelings when I saw a McDonald's logo in a McDonald's restaurant in like, you know, Sao Paulo or, you know, Rio. And I'm just like, okay, how do I, I have this contradiction of feelings right now. I suppose that if I saw cultural forms that are reminiscent of like the proud boys in the United States, then I would probably feel, I would feel repulsed by it, but I would mm. also be like, I recognize that. Mm. That ain't foreign to me at all. Right. right. And so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to add to that. Yeah, but. yeah. I mean, in definitely in in Mexico that exists, and and so what you see is this kind of people who don't identify ideologically with that with la raza or the idea of like you know uh, like the chosen race, Mexican race mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, and who you know traditionally or like within their lives would be very much against that. Um, but suddenly this dynamic with the foreigner is creating this renewed sense mm -hmm. of who am I, right? Well, mm -hmm. I'm because they're American, I'm a Mexican or I'm Oaxacan, right? But even that gets kind of um, confused in, in part because of the, the, the heritage and culture manufacturing of the last century. Mm. You know, like so many people... Uh, Oaxaca is like a cultural destination. So people come for culture. They come to, you know, uh, for the lively street dances and, and fiestas and, and the food, right? And, and, and on and on and the craft traditions and everything. The vast majority of these things, uh, you know, in the way that they're presented are, are only like 100 years old at, at the most, right? And not to say that they didn't exist in the villages in different ways, but uh, pretty much across the board in the Western world and, and, and in non-Western countries, you see in the last century, uh, ministries of culture, ministries of, of heritage that basically create and manufacture uh, this idea of who people are as, quote, Oaxacan, who people are as, quote, mm -hmm. American and Mexican through mm -hmm. tourism. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. And so, you know, and then, and so the people who, and it's, it's totally understandable, right? Because what, what's happened here in the last five years, in just five years, um, well, certainly beforehand, but, you know, in the last five years, especially, is that the historic center of Oaxaca, like Oaxacan, Oaxacan people don't live there anymore. And if they do, it's because they're, they're Airbnb hosts, you know? And so yeah. on the street, what you see is suddenly there's no more Oaxacan people at least like in terms of identifying people uh, racially, like without speaking to them kind of thing. And it's become this place of where everyone just hears English and everyone, mostly everyone is, is white or foreigner. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just a kind of uh, statistical, um, you know, uh, um, thing it's uh it's 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 a lived thing now where everything that was understood as as mine as my culture is now uh centered around the the kind of um capitalist desire of of the center of the city um mm. among foreigners and so it's a very it's very understandable the the resentment 
right? And especially when you consider the, you know, obvious, not always, but most of the time, obvious bad behavior of, of tourists. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a result, what you do see is, is this xenophobia and, you know, a, an, a, an elder of mine, Gustavo here in Oaxaca, he, he once said to me, you know, the thing is, is that when people trade in their traditional hospitality, right, in order to turn it industrial or in order to make a buck off of it or whatever, what they're inviting in, what they're actually buying long term is hostility. And that's what we're seeing now in, in places like this, which is to say that um, the hospitality is gone, right? Uh, it might just be forgotten and not lost, right? Um, but in that same sense, the people here who are whose only recourse is to you know try to uh, make you know anti whitey memes or uh, or 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 call out uh, you know a tourist here and there or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, that they're also now experiencing this sense of what what is home? Where is my home? What is you know? Am I a homeless person within a place that's apparently has all this culture? And so yeah. that's arrived, right? And that's there. And and I think part of the problem, part of the dilemma for local people that largely goes unnoticed is that it's not new. Like this, it's it's not five years old. It's been around for a while, and it's just only now becoming noticeable to people, right? And, and because of the kind of cathartic short-term memory of, you know, 21st century society or culture, people, um, there's an unwillingness and an inability to recognize what's gone unrecognized. And, you know, I think that in order to understand the patterns in all of this and, and the way that the light shines off that prism, in order to see what's what's to come, we have to be able to understand what we couldn't see 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and understand why we couldn't see it, mm. right? And so suddenly it's all here. It's like the, the dilemmas, they're in our face now. and uh, But nobody's willing to ask how it got this way because then they might actually be implicated in how it came to be. And then they might actually be responsible Right? And I don't mean guilty. I'm not talking about guilt. I'm talking about yeah. our ability to respond to what's happened and to what's, what's to come, right? So. Mm-hmm.